example of roads project for example in 2013 to 2017 the jubilee government increased roads by 5800 kilometers during that period now during that period it spent 614 billion on roads that was 60 percent more than the kibaki government in Ilkwe, 376 billion. Ukikuja, the average cost per kilometer the Jubilee government used was 96 million per kilometer. But ukiangalia what the other government used, previous government used was 51 million per kilometer. That's a very big margin and increase. Na kwa nini yo margin inaonekana ku increase hapo? Ukikuja five years later, utapata nine roads zenye zilijengwa, zilikuwa zinatumia 300 million per kilometer. And these roads accounted for 20% of the portfolio of the roads that were built during that period. Now only 3% by volume. Notable roads in Ezilijengo na yo amount ni yo Jamasara to Kisumu Airport na Mombasa Southeastern Bypass. Especially the Mombasa Southeastern Bypass was built by 1,155 per kilometer. Now the previous government will come build na per kilometer utapata hapo ni 30 million per kilometer. Uh, Something of that sort. So the government in Eka projects at a higher cost. So that so long as he kitu inaenda ita petition ku appropriations bill, akuna kitu tuneza fanya government not to not to steal. So in my in my own view, what I think is but uh, you can you can you can go nikona thread about budgeted corruption on roads. You can check on those details, ikona more details. Nani iko kwa charts, na kuna another thread on budgeted corruption on electricity. Ikona more details on how the government ina make sure, in, ina tumia loophole. Should I say a loophole, I mean abuse, whatever. So okay. long as wash up budget co appropriations bill, right. okay. whatever they'll steal from there, ni wow. Right. So what are the solutions that we can stop such things? In 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 my case, as conversing with other Gen Z, we realize that we can't trust the government right now. At the same sense, we can't even trust the judicial system. Ju government bado inalipa the judicial system. So regardless of the president ama the regime in place, watakuwa na lipa judicial system. Na ukiangalia ata ESCC. We can't even trust ESCC. Nilikuwa naangalia a certain meme ilikuwa inatembea ati after 2,000 cases, only 20 cases, less than 20 cases ndio zimekuwa prosecuted na zika, kuwa, zika go through. Na that's a very... Magninio, that's a massive failure rate. So as Gen Z, we can never trust this judicial, we can never trust ESCC, and appear to easy trust the Wabunge. For example, during the, 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 this current financial year, the parliament approved only 313 to come from external loans. But ukiangalia kwa budget enye wamepitisha kwa appropriations bill pale, wanasema aje, wanataka external loans iku almost 850. 50 somewhere somewhere there a uh, maximum in meongezeka of almost five, 500 hiyo yote imekombwa unconstitutional nani the same thing it happened ukiangalia from 2013 to 2022 uhuru did i mean 2013 to 2022 yeah uhuru did the same thing i 4 trillion and i end up borrow 7.7 trillion these are loopholes they'll continue to use and if Set up policies that are inscribed in the constitution, however, regardless of the, of the of the president or the regime in place or the members of parliament in place. So, in my own view, I think we can have a Bitcoin, uh, I mean, a blockchain system. A blockchain system, let me break it down simply so that people can understand how can a blockchain system help us. For example, let's assume. Umekuja kununua nyumba, let's say umekuja town, no, ama you, you are in Tika Road and you are looking for a house, no, umepata Roisambu, I'm there, umenipata mimi ndio nauza nyumba. I give you a folder. In that folder, we can open page one, unaona 2001, this house was built. Ukifungua next folder, unaona 2002, kulikuwa na renovation ya mabati and what not. 2003, but ukiangalia nyumba, unaona hii nyumba ilijengwa na ile bricks ama mawe, zile zilikuwa zinatumika na wazungu, the British by that then. How is it trust my folder? So, blockchain simply is, is, is what can I say? Is simply a diary. In this sense, 
kama nauza hii nyumba so nyumba zote zenye ziko hapa tunaweka na diary na sio mimi peke yake it's a distributed ledger in that mimi na watu wote wanaishi kwa hii kijiji tuko na hii diary na any renovation i make kwa hii nyumba na ikip kwa hii diary so mtu mwenye anakuja kununua hii nyumba akiangalia diary yangu anaenda ku confirm with another diaries from other people that's what blockchain does ina inakuwa distributed ledger from very many people in case my diary has information that other diaries zenye zime record all those transactions haiko hapo Th- that means my diary iko compromised so my diary itatupwa kwa system itatupwa kwa hiyo chain zile blockchain zenye zina diary zina zina entries zenye zinafanana they'll still remain in the empty chain so in short how can blockchain help us uh, for once hata kama president ruto ame amefukuza the cabinet secretaries we as gen z we don't trust that at ruto atakuja back a uh, point other cabinet secretary based on competence atuko sure maybe at a point bado on political loyalty or that but for example through blockchain voting tunaamua ikue kukuwa na certain threshold ya watu fulani kwa kila county ama kila constituency wapige wa, wa kura through blockchain voting so that to approve your csc wananchi to geuze power ikue power to, to bring back we bring back power to us as citizen so that this is citizen to pig a kura through blockchain voting aita itisha pesa mingi ya ibc ku all the elections it's just a blockchain voting so long as uko na phone ama laptop utapigia tuta approve that yes another thing loan approval please but wind up wind up wind up na blockchain voting wakati anytime the government wants to take loan for example when nilikuwa nimesema kama ruto alikuwa ame approve na government only 313 loans kama alikuwa ameapprove only 313 billion na anaenda hapo kwa budget anasema nataka 870 billion hiyo ingine 500 ni extra but kukiwa na blockchain voting tuta make sure so long as una loan the Kenyan government kama utaenda against the constitution ni shauri yako hiyo deni hatutalipa na kwa constitution tushaweka kutakuwa na blockchain voting yenye kama president yoyote mwenye yuko in place si wa leo ama wa kesho tuta vote kama hiyo wananchi wana approve hiyo deni sawa atapewa ata kama wananchi wa approve hiyo deni hatapewa another thing yenye tunafaa tu votee on through that blockchain voting loan usage hiyo loan itumike wapi okay thank right. you thank you uh, thank, thank you very you. much uh, let us go to the next uh, did you finish um, jack uh, did you get your uh, internet did jack get his internet back Jack did you get your internet back? As we wait for Jack uh, to finish what he was saying, where is uh, Chwani? Where is Chwani? He's not to be found. Mahanu be found. Yeah. Mahanu yeah, Mahanu can go. On. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank, thank thank you Eric, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, we can go on. Uh, thank you. Uh thank you for the invitation. My name is Titus Mahanu. I am a, I'm, I'm an advocate of the High Court of Kenya. I practice here in Nairobi uh, for over uh, 10 years now. I have been working in my own small way to try and dismantle these cartels that are tearing down our country. I've been doing my bit um especially on issues that concern Kemsa because I'm one of the service providers there. In fact, on the 22nd of uh, this month we have a huge case that involves the chairman and some part of the management that are demanding a bribe of 15 million from me for pap- before they can approve payment of the services that we rendered uh, I, I, a while ago I, i i saw the story being shared on twitter and i would like to invite all kenyans from all walks of life to keep on monitoring this so back to the issue as to that concerns what we are discussing about i'm going to talk about three issues number one, the finland scandal i've heard about the cries that uh, the lady from wasingishu is talking about i understand that uh, there is a criminal case that is going on but we all need to understand that a criminal case will never lead to refund of that money the most that is likely to happen is that those people that were involved as well as the county government are going to be uh, found guilty convicted or probably ordered to pay a fine 
but still the money that was lost is it is highly unlikely that the money is going to be refunded so what needs to be done because eric and the viewers are asking that the real action that needs to be done at this particular moment moment is we need to put our heads together and file a recovery suit against the county government of Wasingishu, as well as Senator Mandago and all those squandrels that were involved in this heist. So that is point number one. I'm also going to talk about, and perhaps we can get in touch with Eric and Cyprian so that we can put up a legal team. I am willing to part to be part and parcel of that legal team. I can see my, my senior uh, Willis is here and we can work through uh, on this issue so that we can help those people that uh, have suffered in Western issue. Number two, I'm, I'm going to talk about the public debt. And I'm going to pick it up from where Jimmy left. The state is so deplorable that uh, we need to action this. What we need to understand is that all judicial authority in our country belongs to the people. And the same way uh, uh, the Gen Zs have come up and they have forced the, 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 the withdrawal of the finance bill, the people in this country can also come up and demand that the judiciary must exercise the judicial authority in a manner that is in line with the Constitution. I believe that systems are always designed to deliver results. So when you see a system like the judiciary failing to deliver results, that means someone is tempering with the system to make it work that way for their own selfish gains. So we need to start demanding that the judiciary must rise up to the occasion and conclude these cases. In order to assess this issue of the public debt, I suggest that we need also to put up our heads together and perhaps file a composite suit because the constitution allows us to seek declaratory orders, to seek stay orders, to such an extent that we put to halt the payment of this debt to allow for a forensic audit so that we can really understand how did we get ourselves to this point. Okay, how so this just on, you said it is possible to put a suit as, yes. a, as, a, as, as citizens. We can yes. fundraise and, and, and fundraise and Ab put a suit. Ab absolutely, Eric. Under mm. the Constitution, Article 23, Yes. Kenyans can put up a petition and file it in the high court and seek declaratory orders of any nature. Declaratory orders in the nature that this public debt has become a public problem and we need a forensic order, a forensic audit. Stay orders can be granted. And I have also heard Jimmy saying that there are lawyers who are doing pro bono cases in foreign jurisdictions. We have what we call... Um, we have what we in law, we have something called extradition proceedings. We can get orders in our courts and register in those countries that concerns these fellas who have put up these debts against us for purposes of also getting stay orders from those countries. So this legal process is a very strong weapon that we can use at this particular moment. And I can tell you we can get stay orders at this point. Remember, he, uh, the issue of the public debt arises from the law of contract. And under the law of contract, we have several doctrines that can assist us in the circumstances. We have the doctrine of privity of contract, which provides clearly that if you are not part and parcel of a contract or a liability that is arising from a contract, then you are not liable to pay for it. In a country setup, before a government can borrow money. They need to get authority and consent from the citizens. Now, citizens give the authority to, authority to governments to borrow money through parliamentary approval. Just like in a situation of a company, before the, sharehold, before the directors and shareholders can act on behalf of a company, they must get authority from the company, shareholders, under seal. So similarly, even in a country, before a government can borrow, it must demonstrate that it got approval from the citizens. So we citizens can invoke the doctrine of privity to contract and on that basis get stay orders to halt the payment of this public debt pending 
a, a, a forensic audit to ascertain exactly what happened. Of course, the other doctrine that will help us is the doctrine of extupi, whereby if an act arises from an illegality, there is no way if you are part and parcel of that illegality, you may want to benefit from it. So IMF, the, 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 Paris, the, the Paris group, the London group, the Chinese, and the Eurobond, how it's being manipulated, cannot purport to benefit from this illegality if for sure it has been demonstrated that the manner in which these debts came to be is, 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 is not according to what is contemplated in our laws. And almost as I conclude, the doctrine of Estopel can also come in and assist us in prosecuting this case. So as we think about the way forward, we need, of course, as citizens, to start asking questions about disclosure of the contracts that led to these debts. And through this forum, which we have demonstrated that it's a very powerful forum, we can get this information. So all the professionals, all, everyone that is in this forum that is concerned needs to start doing their bit so that we can get this information. Let us start, probably, Eric, the next session we are having let us also have a status update of the matters that we want to progress insofar as this debt is concerned. Let us try to come up with a number of professionals, lawyers, accountants, auditors, so that we start compiling materials for purposes of getting these court orders. So that is what we need to do. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, as, as I conclude on the issue of the status of the revolution, two minutes, one minute, yes. Eric. Yes. As we continue championing on this issue of our revolution, we need to identify short-term and long-term goals. Short-term goals, as the president gears up towards appointing a new cabinet, we need to continue demanding that so many heads need to roll. We need to revamp our state corporations. We need to ensure that these people who are currently serving as state corporation heads, the CEOs, the board members, and the chairman, these people need to go. We need to have an overhaul. We need to start afresh. And as new people are brought into office, the first thing is we need to make public service, uh, we need to decommercialize public service. We need to put up demands to the extent that if you're coming to serve members of the public, you should be paid according to your job group, based on your credentials. If you are an MP, if you are a, if you are a, if you are a, if you are a cabinet secretary, if you are a, a, a CEO of a state corporation, if you are a chairman, if you are a board member, you should be paid your remuneration based on your job group. And job groups are defined by your level of education. That is the only way we are going to decommercialize de public service. And as we demand. A, 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 a demand dissolution of parliament, when new MPs will come in, we should also demand that they should be paid according to their level of education. Job groups, let us have a scenario where if we have an MP who has not gone to, to university or doesn't have any certificate, you should be paid just like a janitor so that you can, if you want more salary, you should be encouraged to go back to school. That is the only way we will be able to make demotivate this thing and slowly by slowly, we will get people who want to serve Kenyans. Thank you so much, Eric, and let's keep on engaging. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, as I hand over this uh, chance to Jack, the young man called uh, Chwani wants to tell us something. Can he tell us what he wants to tell us? Chwani? Chwani, can you start? Can you start, please? Chwani, can you start? Hello. Can you go on, Chwani? This is the last chance I'm giving you. 
All right, consider that chance gone. Uh, let me talk to Jack. Uh, Jack, you were saying something about fertilizer and uh, the contaminated sugar and the cancer that you are going to experience in the next uh, many years. What is this? Jack? Jack? In the next, uh, many. <laughs> yeah. Yes, Eric, uh, thank you so much. Yeah, go on. I hope you've gotten your internet. Uh, we want to finish this very fast to give others an opportunity. You are yes, talking about fertilizer uh, and uh, the contaminated sugar that Kenyans are taking. Kenyans, you are taking contaminated sugar. You are facing years and years of cancer. That is true, Eric. Uh, Metheka Linturi brought in contaminated sugar. And uh, it's, like, it's like life is moving on as usual. We are having... Hello, can you hear me, Eric? Yeah, go on, go on. Your internet is the problem, but go on. <laughs> we are going, you know, very sorry we lost the people like Keuna, and in in the in the near future we are going to have a disaster because of the contaminated sugar that came in under methical injury and went to the market and the president is laughing about it everything is normal life is going on in kenya as usual that one aside we have a fertilizer scandal a minister brings in fertilizer and fertilizer that is not fertilizer that is mixed with maram and cow dung. At the end of the day, the net effect is that the production, the food we are going to harvest this time. I was at home. You have a cup of maize that has less than hardly less than 10 maize tablets on it. It is a disaster. So when I, 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 I realized this, I'm also a chairman of a public investments committee, education on governance. My work is to audit government, is to put government into proper checks and balances. I was so paid because I come from a farming region. Bomola is a farming region and largely Western Kenya. So when I prosecuted the removal of Mithikal Induri, Mithikal Induri went Hello, Cyprian. Are you able to get him? I can't get him. Can, can, can you hear me? Uh, Eric? Your internet is the problem, sir. Eric, can I have two minutes? Let him finish. As I finish, uh, Eric, Mythical Induri must be prosecuted for the crimes he's had against the Kenyan people. And the How Kenyans are you planning must... to do that, sir? There is a case in court already by Law Society of Kenya. By Law Society of Kenya, where we, we are enjoined, and uh, it's coming up. Uh, that he blatantly went against the constitution. Yes, we have a case. Kenyans have a case against him. And we must prosecute mythical injury, and uh, we must move it to the logical conclusion. As I want to support as I support the Gen Z for what they have done uh, up to now, I want to vehemently oppose an idea that is coming up of dialogue. An idea, you see, what the political wing has not achieved for so long because of mixed interests, this generation has done it in less than weeks. Yesterday, I was with uh, Raila Molodinga, my party leader in Azmio. I was with Kalonzo Musioka and all the Azmio Brigade. And I told them, don't interfere with these young people. Let them finish that which they started. 
We cannot dialogue with William Ruto. When now we are getting bodies, young people, whose only problem and mistake was to go on streets and voice what Yes, Eric? yes, go on. We still hear you. Can I speak now? Yeah, yeah. Okay. I, I, I want to be very quick. Now, just to tell you why I was saying people like William Ruto cannot solve this problem, I want to express the illegality that has done over the last one year in his, last, in his first budget. The development budget in the appropriations bill said that they are going to borrow foreign and external loans of 313 billion shillings. 313 billion shillings. Those are the only loans that have been approved on the budget of Kenya. And those have gone to development as per our laws. They are even listed what they are going for. In the last one year, that ended June 30th, his first budget, he ended up borrowing one point. We can hear you. Go on. And I repeat, they are in a conspiracy of a Ponzi scheme. And I again repeat, KCB, Core Bank, and Equity Bank. who are not involved in this malfeasance, and there are many others, get into those banks and deposit. These banks are part of our slavery and they must be cut off, completely cut off. And I want to say, in addition to this, that the only dialogue we should be talking about with William Samoy Ruto is a dialogue at the ballot box, no other. That is where we want to dialogue. And let me end with a famous quote I saw yesterday on one of the on James Smart's Twitter handle. And it was from a famous president from Burkina Faso called Thomas Sankara. He said, if we, don't, if we don't pay the debt, the lenders will not die. But if we pay it, we will die. That is the situation in Kenya. If we continue paying this, we will die. We must stop our death. So, so, so before you go, Jimmy, now can you give us practical steps? Uh, just tell us, these are the practical steps that we need to embrace in order to avoid paying this odious debt. This is what we need to do. This is the next step. This is what we should do. This is what the citizen can do. And this is how we will stop the payment of this odious debt that we are not supposed to pay. The only way, and I repeat, the only way is to remove this regime from power. And any, any, any person who has been part of this malfeasance, especially over the last 12 or so years, must be removed from any decision-making position. That is the only way. The kind of money we are talking about is so humongous, so humongous, you are not going to sort it. And I, I appreciate the legal uh, aspect that you can go to court, you can do this. I'm telling you, you are talking about phenomenal amounts of money. 50, 60 billion dollars that have been looted from us. And I'm telling you, they will buy nearly every institution. You must remove this regime from power. It must get out. It must have a conversation with us at the ballot box before 2027. It is the only way we are going to be able to do this. This is the only single way we are going to stop these bullets that are coming and, and killing our children. It must end. Our death must end. And it can only end with the perpetrators behind bars and them out of power. All right. Uh, before you, of course, you say around so that you give us a parting shot. Uh, I'm looking for Nelson Amenya. 
he with the JKI hist. I've tried looking for him, sent him a link. Oh, he's here. Nelson, go on I'm and here, tell us about the JKI hist. What happened? Why was someone trying to lease or sell our airports? What was the reason? Why were they doing this? I'm sure you, you have the documents. You understand because that is your area. You understand the nitty gritties in that report and that yes. proposal that you shared. Can you please yes. tell us what happened? Yes, thank you very much. Um, we have had hitches and glitches here and there, but finally I'm here. Um, so I just want to talk about this um, very shocking um, documents that I received. Um, and they're being pushed from the highest offices, uh, the ministry, state house, from KAA. So it's not as... Uh, you know, they, they can be able to trace them. Nelson, are you still there? Um, uh, sorry, sorry. I, I think I was muted. So um, I, I was saying if you go to the PPP Act, um, the way we are supposed to do projects, public projects, number one, you're supposed to uh, do bidding. And then number two, you can do direct procurement. And then number three, you can do uh, public uh, it's called PIP, uh, private, privately uh, initiated proposal. And um, wait one second, I opened this um, act. I have it here. Okay, this is the act. So if, for anyone who's interested, it's the PPP Act of 2021. And I'm going to read section... Section 22. Okay, so Section 22 talks about ensuring that there is public participation on any PPP project, which wasn't done by um, by Murkomen and, you know, the KAA team. And then, so Murkomen was trying to bypass all this and he went directly to the PIP. But if you look at the PPP Act, it recommends the um, bidding process it recommends bidding pro uh, bidding uh, process um, over any other way of PPP, but they did not want it to go the bidding process. However, there was companies already willing to bid um, for this listing of JKIA and companies from Singapore, ca companies from Qatar, but Murkomen and his people together with uh, Kositani they went ahead and picked a company called Adani Group from India. Adani Group from India is one of the most corrupt co companies from um, India. It is so corrupt that there was a company from the US, it's called Hindenburg Research. Hindenburg Research did a research on them and the, the revelations were so, super shocking. If you read these things, I'm just going to read a few of them about Edani uh, group. So, Guatam Edani is brother, Guatam Edani is the owner of uh, Adani group. So, Guatam Edani's brother in law, Samia Vora, was accused by the DRI of being a ringleader of the same diamond trading scam and of repeatedly making false statements to regulators. He was subsequently promoted to executive director of the critical Adani Australia division. Guatam Adani's elder brother, Vinod Adani, has been described by media as an elusive figure. He has regularly been found at the center of government's investigations in Adani for his alleged role in managing a network of offshore entities used to facilitate fraud. Our research, which included downloading and cataloging the entire Mauritius corporate registry, 
has uncovered that Vinod Adani, through several close associates, manages a vast labyrinth, labyrinth of offshore shell entities. We have identified 38 Mauritius shell entities controlled by Vinod Adani or close associates. We have identified entities that are also su surreptitiously controlled by Vinod Adani in Cyprus, the UAE, Singapore, and several Caribbean islands. Many of the Vinod Adani associates, associated entities have no obvious signs of operations, including no reported employees, no independent addresses or phone numbers, and no meaningful online presence. Despite this, they have collectively moved billions of dollars into Indian Adani publicly listed and private entities, often without required dis uh, disclosure of the related party nature of the deals. Okay, let me go back up. The Adani Group has previously been the focus of four major government fraud investigations, which have allegedly money laundering, theft of taxpayer funds, and corruption, totaling an estimated US $17 billion. Adani family members allegedly co co cooperated to create offshore shell entities in tax haven jurisdictions like Mauritius, the UAE, and Caribbean islands, generating forged import-export documentation in an apparent effort to generate fake or illegitimate turnover to siphon money from the listed companies. Key listed Edani companies have also taken on substantial debt, including pledging shares of that. It goes on and on and on. They have over 300 corrupt cases, and at the moment, Edani Group um, is led by a man called Edani, and he's the third richest man in uh, in the world. He is second richest man in um, in India. So corrupt is the man, and the companies that they have been named, they have a scandal called the short selling scandal, and it's the biggest corporate scandal in the world in history. So the reason why I'm reading all this is because this is the company that Murkomen saw fit to lease our JKIA for 30 good years. I was reading the proposal, the PIP proposal, and the reason why, the, you know, they have to justify why they went with PIP, and yet in the PPP Act, there is four different ways you can procure, um, you can lease and do PPP uh, partnerships. And the reason why they chose PIP is very lame. They say in this document that the reason they choose PIP is because if they do bidding, it will take 18 months. And in addition, after they have submitted the bidders, it will take an additional four to six months to go through and peruse through the bidding, the proposals, and then um, identify one person or one company to do this uh, project and to list out JKIA for the next 30 years. So the reason behind PIP is very lame and does not qualify why they chose it. And then number two, they did not do public participation. It's hidden. Everything is shredded in secrecy. Everything is being done in hush hush tones. And nobody is, no one knows anything about this deal up to today. And my sources say that in about a month, this, this deal is going to be inked and it will become, uh, as you know, in Tanzania, they are already operating their ports. So they are, they are hoping that even in Kenya, they will quietly enter and sign the deal without Kenyans knowing what's happening to their the most precious international airport, uh, JKIA. And we know JKIA, JKIA is uh, one of the busiest airports in Africa. And to make it even worse, JKIA in their report does not make losses. It actually makes profit. And they have actually said that JKIA is under 
they are underpricing uh, their services. If you compare it with Addis Ababa, Addis Ababa is about 50 to 60 percent more expensive for um, carriers to, to run their operations in Addis Ababa to land all these landing fees. Um, if you compare with JKIA, and they propose that they will double the prices in Kenya. If you double the prices of JKIA alone, um, last year they made about 13 million. Uh, US dollars in terms of profit and about uh, 90 million US dollars in terms of uh, revenues. So if you double, it means JKIA will be going towards 160 million in terms of revenues and about 26 million in terms of um, profits after you've deducted all the operations and everything. Um, so this alone shows you that JKIA is not um, Hajalemewa. It can still operate by itself and we can still go on and do all these projects that we want to do minus this very super corrupt company that Murkomen wants to impose on us without public particip participation and without a bidding process where other people who are more qualified and who are you know don't have integrity issues were ready to bid but they were shortchanged by these corrupt people surrounding uh, the deal and they don't want people to know this this is why we have to speak out about this and then um, another point is that um, so they use an SPV model which means that they will create a company in Kenya which will be running the operations and then they will they went ahead and said they will create a consortium a holding company and a consortium means it's uh, a few companies together and a holding company means that their only work is to um combine so like for example i used to work for a company that is a multinational so a multinational normally has a corporate head office and their corporate head office is only a holding company that just consolidates the income only there is nothing else they're doing they don't do business they don't run anything they just consolidate their subsidiaries so they've created a holding company in uae uae as you've heard from the report is a tax haven this is how people evade tax this is how people want to do the double Dutch sandwich. This is how people want to, like Murkomen, if they want to have the shares in uh, companies, they will take it to the tax haven. And then from there, you cannot trace this money. So we are asking, why are they doing this kind of uh, corporate structure where they have to go through a tax haven like Dubai? Why can't they just operate as a Dani from India directly to Kenya? And... If you go through Dubai, it means that they are able to do something called transfer pricing. And this is how even European companies are stealing from Congo, from Botswana, from so many other different uh, African countries. They steal from these countries through transfer pricing. So how it happens, um, if, uh, for example, Adani says they have a patent, intellectual patent, or whatever patent they have, they will come and say that Adani is charging the Kenyan SPV for such and such a patent. So the income that we make as JKIA in Kenya will be deducted. You know the way EBITDA works? They will deduct the patent as a cost. So by the time it reaches where we have to deduct tax, they have already deducted fake costs in terms of transfer pricing. And this is why they are doing this thing of um, we have to have a company in the UAE and then another company and another company. And it, if it spans towards different jurisdictions, it's harder for us to track our money. And so okay. this is, yes, uh, Americ. Yes. Um, uh, I, I want to interrupt you a bit. Uh, Francis, uh -huh. Francis has been uh, saying a lot about JKIA and uh, how JKIA has been uh, limping, but we can hear from here that there is profit. Francis, what is your comment on this? Because Nelson says JKIA makes a lot of, or KAA makes a lot of profit. I heard there, he said something like 13 million. US Yet we are being told US. every time that it makes losses. No. Francis. Uh, my even my 
I think I was never about, I, I was mostly about Kenya Airways. I was mostly about uh, the leases that were embarked on. Uh, in fact, the other day, somebody told me, uh, I had a whistleblower telling me that uh, there were two companies which were incorporated in the Cayman Islands and whatnot. Uh, one was, I think, called Kifaru and uh, another one called uh, uh, I'll remember the names shortly. Uh, but they bought some Embraer. Embraer is, a, uh, is an airplane uh, brand from Brazil. And they all of them are, have, are denoted with the, with the code name FF, which was First Family, uh, which are owned by Uhuru Kenyatta. And so uh, Kenya Airways was compelled to pay those outlandish leases uh, on behalf of uh, Kenya Airways to... Air aeroplanes owned by the Kenyatta family, uh, who uh, those those code names are denoted with FF, uh, which was the Embraer uh, Embraer model. And so when Ruto came in, uh, don't forget that uh, uh, when we are talking about odious debt, uh, connect to Kenya Airways because it's been one of the vessels which has been used to siphon taxpayers' money into private accounts. So. When uh, Ruto came in, when he was supposed to resolve those issues, uh, then some of his cronies have gotten also other flights so that we can continue funding Kenya Airways from taxpayers' money. Uh, we can continue uh, giving them money under the guise of bailing out. And we've given them, first of all, don't forget when it was being privatized in the 90s, we were told that by privatization it will be self-sufficient, it will be profitable, and they came up with all these cock and bull stories is just to sell the privatization agenda when I was talking about Philip Ndegwa and whatnot. But if you look at the amount of money we have spent post-privatization, it is close to 100 billion Kenya shillings. Now, that money, uh, money because, uh, first of all, uh, I was talking about somebody, the, the CEO at the time was Titus Naikuni. Titus Naikuni, first of all, he belongs to committee prison. I don't understand why uh, Titus Naikuni, if we are giving the same treatment to Farah Malim, he goes to Sarova and he's, he, he's told he cannot stay there because of his toxic utterances, then Titus Naikuni should not be allowed to eat or drink anywhere uh, just like we want to do with David D because of his toxicity uh, defending war crimes. Uh, we should not be allowing these people to live amongst us. So so, Titus Naikuni then came somebody called Bovin Gunze. Bovin Gunze was the one now, uh, and, and now the chairmanship was uh, Michael Joseph. Michael Joseph is a crook from South Africa. I don't know how he ended up here. I don't know how he was at one time the chairman of Safaricom and KQ and all almost all the blue, the, 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 the well-performing blue chip companies. But if you look, there is always a paper trail of corruption. Uh, the, then uh, Jeremy uh, um, Bovin Gunze was was the CEO of Kenya Airways when they were being bailed out with uh, billions of shillings of our taxpayers' money to pay for uh, 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 air, uh, for, fly, for leases or, or for aircraft owned by the Kenyatta family. And his brother, <laughs> you can't make this stuff up, I kid you not, his brother called Jeremy, uh, Jeremy Ngunze was the CEO of uh, CBA uh, Kenya Chapter. So here we have two brothers uh, working for the same criminal outfit, which is called the Kenyatta Family Criminal Enterprise, siphoning taxpayers' money because now CBA is also amongst other banks which are which have uh, profited from anti-competitive practices. Uh, they have been involved in intellectual property theft. They have been involved also in the debt issue. They appear in the debt register of the banks. Uh, I know we, we, we have spoken about uh, Equity Bank. We have spoken about KCB. We have spoken about Corp Bank as the lead banks which have funded and fueled the government's appetite for debt. We, uh, if you go there, you just want a million shilling overdraft. They will make you jump through hoops so that you can uh, you can just access an OD of just a million shillings. But they give government a uh, cut blanche. They give them billions of shillings every year under the guise of domestic debt because it's as you had, it's a Ponzi scheme. Uh, yes. James Mwangi has become a dollar billionaire in this in this republic 
from buying bonds from domestic debt uh, yes. we, mopping up mopping up capital from the commercial market we cannot yes. get credit uh, our mm. biggest weakness is a uh, lack of credit when we are doing enterprise and it's okay. because all the money is going to government because they have seen it is lucrative to loan to government and then they can be able to sort themselves out there with their own commissions and whatnot so yes. kenya yes. airports whether it makes uh, a profit or not first of all don't forget that they terminated the greenfield terminal which was supposed to expand our capacity to make us a competitive hub in the region ethiopia has taken over us first of all they have more aircraft uh, in kenya we invested in these small planes called embraer uh, those embraers they are being taken to the key routes they don't have good facilities if it's the business class if it's the first class and so we are uh, underwriting the delusions and we are underwriting the poor uh, financial decisions of kenya Airways, uh, based on our taxes so we as we take on the audit of the odious debt, we must also audit all the poor financial decisions that have been uh, undertaken by uh, the subsequent governments and individuals in, with a view, with an objective of securing our money. We have to convert whatever uh, private uh, assets that they have taken from our country. We have to secure them. They have to be returned to the state. They don't have to be regrabbed by other people. They have to be regrabbed. Everything even the MPs who have stolen CDF money, we have to now repossess that so that it goes into the uh, into uh, to, to the state because these were crimes which were committed and we have to catch up with time that they have uh, Thank you. stolen from Thank us. You. Thank you very much, Americs. Thank you. Uh, all right, Nelson, that was just a, a kicker on uh, what you were saying. Uh, maybe you can tell us uh, in in a, in a few minutes, two minutes or three, before we give Masi Tarus and the rest, I can see so co-analyst here and the others. Uh, what can we do as a nation? You know, we talk too much. But in your opinion, because you are the professional here, what can we do? The lawyers are here to guide us on the legal journey. They can tell us what to do. But what are you going to do? Or what do you propose we do as a nation to ensure that such kind of uh, hist and the people behind it are put in jail. Um, thank you, Amerix. Um, can can I just finish the like three four points I had, and then I can talk about what we should do. You have, uh, in the interest of time, you have uh, three minutes. Okay, okay. So I just wanted to also say that um, in this deal and proposal, they are trying to uh, propose. Uh, the government to to concessions and one of the concessions they want is that they want to operate in Kenya tax free. They haven't mentioned the number of years. They just say they want to operate without paying in uh, corporate income tax for some years. And also, um, I don't know if this is standard uh, in deals, but they're saying after the deal is over in 30 years, JKIA will have to uh, pay, pay for the capex um, and also they will have to pay them for the capex the money they used for the capex which is one which is 1.5 billion uh, us dollars and in my view this 1.5 billion us dollars is the same amount of money we saw the euro bond uh, theft the money that never arrived in kenya so it means that we are able to even finance this project on our own if we can take back the money that has been stolen. And they're also saying that after the 30 years is over, it's not over because they're asking for 18% equity in JKIA forever. So this means that basically they will own us forever, 18%. And this is totally unacceptable. And mind you, this company is uh, the, the least performing company in India in terms of uh, airport operations. And their biggest project is called Navi Mumbai. It's their only biggest project that you can compare to JKIA. The rest, you cannot, they're too small. And even this Navi Mumbai is going to be finished in 2032. So we are entrusting people who have not even done a project of this magnitude in any of their projects to do it in Kenya. Like we are being used as uh, scapegoats. So, um, and your question, uh, Americ, about what we need to do is, it's very simple. We need to make a lot of noise. And also we need to, 
start preparing to take over these positions. We cannot just be in the outside and every day, you know, we, we keep uh, complaining about bad governance. We need to be the leaders we want to see. We need to go into those leadership positions. You have seen in the UK, um, they were inaugurating very young Gen Z leaders into the House of Commons. So this this needs to be to happen also in Kenya. But at the moment, we need to increase the pressure. We need to occupy JKIA. We need to occupy all those offices until these things stop happening. Uh, this is how revolutions happened in the past. I've, talk, I've, I've spoken so much about the French Revolution. It was the young people who went and uh, demanded, you know, th th their rights and demanded for what was right. And it happened. It's not easy. It can take a lot of time. It can, it can take short, shorter time. But if we keep pushing, it will happen. And also I have spoken about critical junctures. How in history, when a revolution happens, you have two choices. You can either go the side of whatever people are talking about, like Sudan and the rest, or you can go the path of prosperity. And this is what happened in, Fra in France. This is what happened in England during the Glorious Revolution. This is what happened in the US. This is what happened in many other prosperous nations. They were at this critical juncture, a revolution moment, and they chose to go the right direction. So this is the moment that we, as the young people, we need to choose which direction to take our country to either reclaim it and go and become prosperous and to say no to all these things that are happening now or to turn our eye and lose the revolution and, you know, everything that Jimmy Wanjigi has just spoken about to continue. So the choice is ours, but everything is laid, us, is laid bare on us. And uh, there is a saying, as I finish, um, that I quoted in one of the spaces. It says, in every generation, we have our mission. So every generation has a mission and it's upon us either to fulfill the mission or to, to betray the mission. So it's upon us today as the young people to either fulfill our mission of economic liberation and independence in Kenya or to betray it. Thank you very much, Nelson, for that uh, in-depth. Uh, there was one, only one person who had a remaining issue, I think because of network. I'll give them a minute or two. Masi Tarus. Masi Tarus. Yeah, go on. Uh, just uh, unmute your mic and start talking so that we don't waste time. Thank you very much. Uh, I hope you can hear me yes. now. Uh, I hope you can hear me yes, now. Yes, yes. Thank you very much. We are giving much. you two minutes. You can switch on. You can switch off your yes. your uh, your space so that you don't listen to right. yourself again. That's why we are um, having this miscommunication. We are going to talk about the fertilizer scandal and bad seeds. What most people don't know, uh, a colleague of mine has tried to talk about it. But what most people don't know is that this is the season that the fertilizer scandal came out. But last year, 11 months ago, there were bad seeds. People in Baringo were given seeds that after they planted, only they only harvested cobs. Can you imagine that? So you guys, you need to think about, is this a sabotage or what is this? What, what is happening to the food security? Um, by the way, to Fikirie, what happens to that farmer when he's uko away from Nairobi? When these people came to to do a community for and hear from the farmers, they were given a report later Nairobi. Our say report in Walete, they wrote that report and shelved it. And then the report that came to the Senate was not the report that they took from the farm. Now you can imagine this farmer has loans. Uyu farmer last season alikuwa sabotaged. This season amekuwa sabotage. So in a manisha next ne, ikifika next year, umse hata kwa na doya hata kwa na doya school fees. Sasa kuna food insecurity. A farmer who who whose main agree, whose main economic thing is farming, say hana food. Now this is manufactured poverty. That is how they keep us in line. This person now has lifestyle diseases because of depression, stress. 
anafaa lipe school fees hana pesa last season hako harvest anything this season hata harvest anything most probably next season they will come up with something else to make that farmer remain poor so that they can depend on that mp on that woman rep on that governor and all those leaders but again that is what the government does for you as i finish why are we here it is because the people that been put in those offices they don't have merits we lack meritocracy um say had three policies then you can imagine a, a whole cs is being asked if they know about that <laughs> if they know about that fertilizer and what do they say they say my boss knows that the that there was fake fertilizer and then first of all before i say maybe anakata and i say mami ni si do anything about fake fertilizer someone who is supposed to stand on such an important ministry again integrity issues so this person hana merits this person does not know the policies because they don't have any merit to be in that office and they do not follow the rule of law so they have integrity issues medics it is important that you know that the person who is chairing your senate committee for health is mandago someone who has who is under scrutiny for embezzlement fraud corruption of 1.1 billion is overseeing your committee in the senate so that when you start asking why you are not being posted why they want to not follow that cba policy that you guys signed you know who is behind that thing we want to, the president to understand that being fired does not insulate you from prosecution what were state house kama mnasikia hii go and tell mr president that we have said that even if you fire them it does not insulate them from prosecution right now they, we had we have food insecurity due to that fertilizer scandal due to the bad seeds that were provided to the farmers and now we want to sit pretty and look pretty as if nothing is happening in the country repentance mr president without restitution is, is just hot air hakuna kitu yenye umefanya hapo sasa umse ameenda amefaya cabinet yake hiyo haina shida but sasa aliwafaya very ceremoniously amewaita mkutano amewa amewapea food wamekaa hapo wame discuss vitu zao alafu after a few days ndo anakuja anatuambia by the way guys i fired these people we are not stupid you give them a state of the art send off like they are going to represent us in a very lucrative spot but we are watching now he's creating room for marriage between the government and the opposition which is not about them the government or the opposition and it seems like they are forgetting that it is about the people of kenya giving their lives for the rule of law to be upheld finally this is not just about the people who have given their lives it is also about those people whose lives have been brutally taken by the police mr president this is my parting shot there is nothing as dangerous as a broke broken and desperate person fighting for a better future because he will do everything in his power to survive chelangat mutai <laughs> died on the sabasaba of 2013 like a true hero let's give her her flowers thank you uh thank you very much mercy for that mwenye masikio amesikia lekish uh hi americs before he speaks i just want to say that e e deal ya jka it's going to be signed in one month so guys we need to you know make pressure and also we are going to court tomorrow to um make them release the documents and make them public mm. for participation all right so you're going to court tomorrow yes we yeah, yeah please, some please do. um i think i'll create something like an mchanga or something so that this public litigation or public interest litigation uh, we can have a fund where people uh, if kina willis or whatever lawyers go to court can be sending them some mafuta here kidogo and credit um so we will follow it up and see how it goes on thank you very much rufus thank you. 
Uh, hi everyone, and uh, thanks Americs for the opportunity. So um, my input on this conversation is that uh, nobody is talking about the money. So the way we conventionally view the money, uh, it's something that we use in our day-to-day -day lives. It's something that we earn when you work a job, when you do a business, but there's more to money, and I think everyone needs money. So the way, personally, I view money, it's a technology that we use to store value. In a way, or in a very simplistic way, if you go and work somewhere and provide labor that is worth, let's say, 10 mils, then you need to have a technology that stores that value, so that when you need that value in future, you're able to recoup that 10 meals for either for yourself or for your kids. But then the current system that we have with the Kenya shilling hasn't been working well. And this is due to the current monetary policy we are having. So if you have wondered or seen how, let's say, a primary school or secondary school teacher was able to raise a family of five, in the 90s have a decent home and perhaps even a car and today that reality is impossible it's mainly because the money is broken so we don't talk about these things and uh, i think it's very important that everyone as we go through this civic education tries to understand what money is and how the current administration is uh, making it so worse that even for the most corrupt guys they understand the money is broken. If you look at uh, some of these corrupt politicians, they're simply converting their Kenya shillings into either dollars or just buying real estate because they know that the M2 money supply in Kenya is being expanded. So over the last one year, M2 money supply was uh, expanded by 6.1%, which means that if you are an average Kenyan and your income didn't go up by 6.1%, then the purchasing power of your money has really gone down. Your personal economy is uh, simply losing. So you're working hard and hard to keep earning an income, but the purchasing power of your money is simply just going down. So I believe it's time we start questioning these things, uh, bring transparency to understand uh, how much Kenya shillings are supplying in the economy, how much of this amount of money is being added into our economy? Because everything is added without uh, work being done, it's value being stolen from your money, the person who is uh, holding Kenya shillings. So think about it this way. If you have a pot of boiling tea, which is worth, let's say, 10 cups, and somebody comes and adds a glass of water in that, and then fetches a glass of tea, then they didn't create new tea. They basically stole from everyone who owned the previous tea. So that's the same way it applies. So the moment you see money being expanded by 6.1% in a year, this is how you're supposed to interpret it. So if everyone, everyone of you guys who are in this space have contributed economically, to grow the economy by 5%. Every farmer who has grown food, every teacher who have dedicated their time to teach for a whole year, and every other person in the economy who have contributed value to the economy. And once you calculate all that into what we call the GDP, and the economy has grown by, let's say, 5%, and then the government expands the monetary supply of the Kenya shilling, what basically that means is that all the contribution we have made into the economy is being stolen by expanding the monetary supply. So when I was listening to Jimmy Wanjege talking about the expansion or, or the sources of money for the, for, from the, for the government, yes, he talked about raising taxes, money through taxes. He talked about raising money through debt to fit a deficit which is limited by the constitution he missed the point that the kenya shilling is the one true 
asset that the government uses to take value even from the money that you hide from on your mattress it's not safe the government has the ability to devalue that by expanding the amount of money supply in the system and that's a really important conversation that everyone needs to have so once we answer the question of what is money how is it created yes. is there transparency mm-hmm. then it will become clear that we have to address these issues with the central bank monetary policy thank, thank you, you very much rufus um, um so analyst are you there you can uh, raise your issue so analyst there is a petition we 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 took to um different institution seeking the arraignment of paramalim i don't know how far it went but i'm looking for soko analyst uh, wherever he is if he's not there um you can give this opportunity to uh this young man called milton milton what do you want to say sir welcome uh thank you so much uh, uh, there's something that i've been really thinking about whenever whenever uh, we've had uh, this citizen assembly we've always had uh, some members of parliament also coming in another conversation uh, i really concur with what jimmy said about our debt and i just think the best thing is just to default but now on top of that our recurrent expenditure is something that is a, a very huge thing to this small country yeah so i i i, I was thinking about uh, this and i wanted maybe willis to advise us yeah uh, how do citizens come up with a, with a referendum uh, because at the moment the country is ripe for it how do we come up with a referendum the ibc is going to be formed and wherever how can the citizens come up with a referendum because we are paying people too much and uh, the country can't sustain that and also we also i think we are also pay like uh, paying uh, the so called wakora a lot of money and then uh, i don't know i don't know how we are going to also balance the issue of integrity and leadership because most of the time you get that we we like most people vie in kenya so that they get protected you find a member of parliament maybe has been involved in cases of money laundering or maybe a foreign national uh, foreign nationals gold and such like criminals most of them usually vie so that when they are members of parliament or, or they in leadership it's at least easier for them to maneuver the cases because one when you're a member of parliament and you're a criminal there is a there is a say someone once told me that the government loves criminals in this way if you're a criminal so for example let me say someone like john waluke he that is a vote for the government in any bill they will bring whether they say that tomorrow like we are we are supposed to like behead everyone he will vote yes why because he knows that if he doesn't vote yes the next minute uh, the dca will be there and wherever he'll be accused even of terrorism right that is the country people who have very bad uh, like reputation and all that stay like uh, like are prevented from vying maybe willis can tell us uh, about that because that is something that is it has been really traumatizing me most of the time i keep thinking about it because if we don't solve the issue of integrity we are still going to have animals not even human beings very bad animals in parliament and with yes. that they will always because they will always be representing us they will always vote for the wrong things because they fear being uh, arrested most of these mp's even senators who maybe they were in opposition and joined the government side most of them if you dig down you will find out that someone ate some something at kplc someone was caught with the there's a police officer who told me last year that uh, there is a certain member of parliament who he jumped from ODM to supporting the government side he, was, he told me that they arrested him with fake money yeah they arrested a certain member of parliament with fake money so this guy he has he has cases deep down so he has to support the government in whichever whichever situation so maybe willis can advise us on that because we need to reduce some oh, yeah. and we need integrity to be something that uh, we keep top notch thank you all right uh willis will uh will uh, tell us that as we wind up uh so analyst uh, three minutes uh Amerix, thank you very much i don't have much to say but uh, one i would like to urge every young person in kenya to get an id so that we can actually be able to 
to vote out these people come 2027. Then number two, uh, we need to actually study and understand how to recall an MP because I believe if we can recall 50 MPs, we can have the remaining ones and impeach the president. Then number three is uh, we need to understand that Ruto loves criminals because that's the only way he can be able to leverage against them and get what he wants. Right now, every person is actually very angry and bitter. So let us keep up the 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 engagement. Let us educate our brothers and sisters in the up country. Let us talk to our fathers, our parents, our grandparents for them to understand what is really going on. And lastly, um, we also need to uh, we need to say hello to EPRA because they've gone behind uh, and increased the road levy from 18 to 25 shillings. And this is very illegal. So as we plan for for Tuesday, we also need to look at the hanging fruits so that people can actually realize that we are, we are, we are not joking and we are very serious. Other than that, uh, thank you so much for Amerix and um, CPLAN for this this space. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. Straight to the point. W Willis, there's that uh, EPRA, there's that levy that they have increased 18 to 25. Is it legal? Is that thing legal? It's obviously, it's obviously not, le not legal. Hmm. Uh, one thing I must point out at this point is that for all of us as citizens, what I like about this platform is that it brings everybody across the board. People who are working in government, people who have access to documents, people who have access to information. What we need to do as we are continuing with this struggle is let encourage our people in those spaces to become whistleblowers. If you don't have the courage to speak openly, you can share this information even to Amerix, to myself, or to any other person who you believe has the courage of their conviction to speak out. Collect as much as you can. Your brother, your sister, your friend, your father, your auntie, works in government, has access to what is going on. Please collect as much information as you can. You can hand it over confidentially to those who are courageous enough to face the public. Once we have this trove of evidence, we will be able to now take on this system. I say that because you find most of these complaints, they are actually illegalities. These are criminal enterprise that is going on in the country as we speak. And to take down that criminal enterprise, part of it is we must get it on the streets, but also if we are to use their system, we must use that court platform to expose them and to call them to account. Even the CSS who've been uh, sacked, it cannot just go for nothing. Those CSS, some of them were in, in, in complicit in criminal activities. They need to be charged. If the DPP will not charge them, if I have access to any evidence that implicates them or any other lawyer, and there's already a team of lawyers who are out here trying all they can to collect evidence and they are willing to present cases in court to even privately prosecute those CSS to answer for these crimes. For those of our people who have been killed, those of our people who have been maimed, inasmuch as Komi has now resigned, Komi must still be called to book. Inasmuch as Kindiki has been dissolved, Kindiki must still be called to book. Those lives cannot have been lost for nothing. They must answer for the criminality under the command responsibility as we know it. And I was suggesting to some of my colleagues and something we are exploring, there's this concept of universal declaration the jurisdiction that in as much as you may think that you control the courts in Kenya, I can be free to file a case against you in an EU jurisdiction that recognizes the criminal concept of universal jurisdiction. So if you are William Ruto sitting in Kenya, you think that you are immune to prosecution in Kenya. We are still free to even file a case against him under the command responsibility for these officers who have gone rogue. And we say... This unit has killed this many Kenyans. And you will see a warrant of arrest being issued against William Ruto in an European country or any other jurisdiction that recognizes the universal jurisdiction uh, in place. Like happened when you witnessed when a court in, some small court in France one day issued a warrant of arrest against uh, Kagame. It was because, I mean, look here. You are being mentioned adversely. There's evidence that seeks to uh, imply and they issued warrants of arrest for him to appear in that court. They must deal with that case diplomatically and to deal with the issue that you raised. We must be able to also call our own to account, if not locally, internationally. And lawyers are able and they are willing to go this far 
to make sure. So what sure is the first thing we will start with this week? I heard Nelson thing, saying uh, he's going to court tomorrow. Yes. Now, what, what, what case, are we doing Nelson ourselves? Is, so Nelson's case, he has already collected evidence. What I will urge that in these other cases, people to collect evidence and share them. Number two, as you suggested, sometimes you, they may need, you can even do a citizen's uh, forum you raise funds to support lawyers who may be doing these cases outside there and may need some support or to file those cases, getting filing fees, whatever it is, you can put that also in as a, as a team. And you get somebody who is independent, transparent, to manage and oversee. Amrex yourself, you are able to, I believe you have the confidence of the people to oversee something like that. But the main thing is that even when these cases come up, we turn up in court. We must show the courts that this case does not belong to the lawyer this case belongs to the people of Kenya and it is being pursued for their interest. Thank you very much, Amrex. All right. Uh, thank you very much for joining us uh, this Sunday. And uh, it has been a great Sunday. Uh, of course, everyone will have wanted to be given a mic, but uh, as we say, it is not as easy as we expect. <laughs> Thank you.